Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2301 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This is the sixth of a ten-message series covering the characters of Christmas. This message is titled, The First to Know, Shepherds. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. What a special time today is. Special time of worship, special time of fellowship, a special time of baptism and what that means, a special time of welcoming somebody who's attended here for years officially into Putnam's membership. We praise the Lord for a day such as this. Have to tell you, though, that makes me a bit nervous, though, with all this going on, but I just praise the Lord for him. Last week, we focused on dealing with dilemmas as we found how Paul found himself between a rock and a hard place and how by prayer and supplication he determined that the Lord wanted him to carry on with his ministry to help those that needed help. And today is the first message of Advent as we continue from last year as we investigate some of the characters of Christmas. And today is the first to know, the shepherds. And our scripture today is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. It's on page 1590 of your pew Bibles, if you want to follow along. And this chapter is titled, The Birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to the firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were, sh were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news, and will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared in heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that he had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And on the eighth day, when it was the time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given to him before he was conceived. Christmas. It's a time of reflecting on the years gone by. It causes me to reflect on Christmas as growing up with my parents and my nine siblings in an old rundown farmhouse. We never had much growing up, but it was always a magical time of year for me. My mom always made sure it was special. Now as we decorate the big house, as we call it, I reflect on the 120 years of other Christmases that have gone by all in the same family. Traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation, we are truly blessed. Like the star that hangs on the front of our house has been started with my grandfather generations ago, decades ago, and we continue on each year glorifying God through these simple means. But it takes us back to a chilly night in Bethlehem 2000, over 2,000 years ago 
A story was unfolding that would not only be the most significant event of the year, but also all those who lived in Israel in the most significant event in the entire history of the world. And that's not hyperbole. This was a story that the Jewish people eagerly awaited, the fulfillment of a promised deliverer that the prophets had passed down from generation to generation. God had issued an unconditional promise to the people of Israel, out of their nation, out of the tribe of Judah, out of the family of their beloved King David, would come the Messiah. <laughs> then after 400 years of silence, God spoke through an angel to inform the Jewish couple that Christ's child would be born into their family. Mary, a virgin, would conceive with the Holy Spirit to give birth to Jesus. So you would think when this story finally broke, when this baby finally broke free of Mary's womb and entered into this world, that the announcement would be all rolled out by the Almighty with incredible fanfare. At least that's what I would have done if I was God. But it wasn't how Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, made his appearance. If we return to your bulletin insert today on the side, it says the birth of Jesus at the top. We have four things we want to look at today. The first is, it was the most humble of all entrances into this world. You see, during the time that Christ was born, a lot was happening on the world stage. The great nephew of Julius Caesar, whose name was Octavian, had just been crowned the new Caesar. Now, we know Octavian by the name of Augustus, and that was given, a name given to him by the Roman Senate in order to confer a godlike status on him. Augustus was the first of the Roman monarchs who demanded worship of him, and his people were not hesitant to deliver that worship. After all, this was the ruler who achieved world peace. In all senses, the Pax Romana, Roman peace, was known throughout the world. Now to most, Caesar was God, and life would be forever Roman. And for the Jewish people, the dream of the Messiah King in their minds was becoming all but dead, except for a minority who held on to that promise that actually read and studied and believed what the prophets had said. Luke's narrative begins with a call by Caesar for a census and a tax. Now Caesar thought he was acting on his own volition, but little did he know that this now forgotten ruler, that God used his demand for a census to set into motion events that would ultimately lead to the birth of the king, who unlike Caesar, would have a throne that would never end. Caesar's declaration forced that ordinary villager, a village carpenter, and his pregnant teenage bride to make a journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The journey undoubtedly taxed that's the strength of that poor young woman. What Caesar didn't know was that the baby in the womb of that peasant woman was the very Messiah that the Jewish people had longed for. The one whose birth truly changed the world forever. The most significant life in history was in the womb of this young Jewish peasant girl named Mary. This baby inside Mary was not a Caesar who fashioned himself as a god, but it was Jesus, the very Son of God, the God of the universe. He was God in the flesh. We look at point two. What, why wasn't there a celebration then? You would think there should be. It says a blessed occurrence. But when you think about it, what was happening that night of that mystery when God came down to dwell among his people, the mystery of Jesus being born fully man and yet somehow fully God, that long-awaited promise, that long-awaited promised one, finally broke free. But where was the celebration? In a small town and these poverty-stricken parents he was born in a smelly cave. It was the Son of God. Caesar should have been there to worship Jesus, but he wasn't. Herod should have been there to worship Jesus, but he wasn't. The people of Israel should have been there to worship Jesus, 
but they didn't. The nation of the world, nations of the world should have bowed down to this baby, but they didn't. Later, the apostle John would write in John chapter 1, verse 11, he came to his own people and even they rejected him. This wasn't a big deal for most of the world, but it was a big deal in heaven. It was a big deal among the people of God who truly believed, the true believers who anticipated Christ's coming. Christmas allows us to have a powerful reminder that what is important in heaven is often unimportant here on earth. While the world was sleeping, the Son of God made his entrance. This was cause for celebration in heaven as the host of heaven rejoiced at the unfolding of God's plan to the world. For 400 years, God was silent. There was no prophets, no angels appearing, nothing miraculous, but now the heavens opened with rejoicing. The news came to a people he you least expected to employ as your messengers of that good news. And takes us to our third point. Why the shepherds? Of all people, why the shepherds? You see, public relation professionals today would work hard at securing opportunities, trying to get their guests in front of millions of eyeballs. But when God announced the birth of Jesus to the world, he used an opposite approach. If we were living today, he didn't send Jesus to New York City. Or even of that day, he didn't send Jesus to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, where the temple was. He sent the host of heaven to a common field outside of Bethlehem. And those chosen as his spokespeople were unpolished, sweaty, stinky, uncouth shepherds. Shepherd staff and a shepherd robe we often see in Christmas pageants. And we say, oh, aren't those cute shepherds? Maybe you've played a shepherd at school or at church sometime. And these represent our shepherds today. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> but in the first century, shepherds were not thought of as cute. And indeed, nobody thought they were even very important but they were the first to know about Christ's birth. Shepherds were not considered part of polite society in those days. They were required to tend their flocks outside of the city gates. They didn't want those stinky sheep inside the gates of the city. And the only reasonable significance that the shepherds had was that they raised sheep, which was a valuable commodity, especially when it got closer to Passover. When their lambs would be sacrificed at the temple, people were begging for unblemished lambs at that point. The work of the shepherd was and still is extraordinarily hard and difficult. They had to wrangle those obstinate sheep which often didn't follow like they were supposed to. They had to ensure that their flocks were well fed, so they had to find grassy plains and water for them. They had to fend off predators, wolves, and even larger animals like lions or bears. And sometimes even unsavory characters would sneak in and come and try to steal the sheep. This is why the shepherds laid across the entrance of the sheepfold to make sure no one entered in. And they would take shifts at night to keep watch to make sure their sheep were protected, that their livestock was not compromised. And yet... There's something significant about the pow uh, powerful in including the shepherds in Jesus' story today. Luke is reminding us by mentioning shepherds that the kingdom of God isn't just for insiders. It's mostly for those outsiders. Like the shepherds, like the poor classes of people that Mary and Joseph came from, it reminds us that the kingdom of heaven is often made up of not the noble and the wise, but of the underclass, those who have no business near royalty, Emmanuel, God with us, means that God is genuine and true to all classes of people. He holds no regard. And it's not simply for the well-connected or the well-resourced. The presence of shepherds in the Christmas story tells us a little bit about the kind of Messiah that Jesus would be. He would come to us as a savior, yes. As a king, yes. As a lion, yes. 
but he also came to us as a shepherd. Though their vocation was not viewed with respect by their peers, Scripture consistently portrays shepherding as one of the highest callings in the Old Testament, perhaps the most repeated of image, image of leadership in all of the Bible. You think about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and for 40 years, Moses were all shepherds. That was their occupation. God even refers to himself as the great shepherd, Israel shepherd, in Genesis 48 and 49 and Jeremiah chapter 31. In David's most famous of all psalms, he is grateful that the Lord is my shepherd in Psalm 23. And the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah often warned God's people about those who were poor shepherds, bad leaders who would exploit those rather than lead them like they should. To shepherd in God's word is to care for those that are vulnerable in your care and to care for them sacrificially. Those days, shepherds would drive their herds, would not drive their hoods, but they would gently lead their herds into the pastures that they were feeding them. The Holy Spirit intentionally includes a vision of a gentle yet firm leadership, the way God leads his people, leads us, and how God intends those who are shepherds of the flocks in the world today to follow and to lead. In fact, one of the last words of Jesus left for Peter before he left this world was, feed my sheep, in John 21. And this is how we're, all of us, as ministers of God's kingdom, are to demonstrate God's love for caring for others with soft hands and compassion for one another. And that's why I believe the announcement of the coming of Jesus, who called himself the Good Shepherd, in John chapter 10, verse 11, it had to happen in the with the shepherd's field among those who lead sheep. Luke tells us that the ruler who has come was a different kind of ruler. His people than his people were used to seeing. He wouldn't be a Caesar who ruled by brute force. He wouldn't be a Herod who governed by treachery, murder, and paranoia. No, Jesus would be, among all of his other attributes, a shepherd. He would entrust himself at his birth to the message of shepherds. That Lamb of God would first be held, would be handled, would be touched by those who knew and how to appreciate and how to handle those young lambs. And yet, more than anybody, these shepherds ultimately knew the fate of their lambs that they cared for. I imagine they heard the prophecy of Isaiah more keenly than anyone in Israel. They tended the very lambs that would be sacrificed at the Passover. And yet the lamb had now come. It would be our final sacrifice. The lamb wouldn't simply cover the sins of the sacrifices like the Old Testament sacrifices did. This lamb would actually become sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. John the baptizer said about Jesus a little later in John chapter 1, verse 29. He said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The good news of the coming Lamb of God, who was slain for the sins of the world, was announced among the lambs that were set aside to, for a temple sacrifice. It was done in the city of David, Israel's last great shepherd. This is God declaring to his people that Jesus, the good shepherd and the Lamb of God, was coming to make true peace between God and man. He would join them together. And that brings us to the fourth point today. The shepherds were chosen because of their belief and awe that they had. I relate to the shepherds. I picture them as rather simple folk. They knew their occupation well. But it wasn't really a glorifying occupation. Because one minute they were watching their flocks, maybe catching a few minutes of shot eye between night shifts. And then the next minute, they were, they were witness to the salvation history. The display in heaven must have been spectacular. As the sky around them filled up with a host of heaven, praising God and worshiping him. I do not doubt that there wasn't just a small ensemble of angels 
or a chief angel, but a host of ten thousands upon thousands of angels appearing in that night sky. Not even the most incredible performance of the best musicians today could parallel the astonishing celebration that unfolded on that big screen of Bethlehem sky. The plan of God conceived from before creation, from time immemorial, the plan of redemption, which was promised in the garden, was being unfolded before their very eyes of those shepherds that day. And I always find it interesting how God seems throughout Scripture to interrupt the show, to show up in the middle of ordinary people's daily lives. You think of Gideon, who was just treading out the wheat, and then all of a sudden God called him to lead the nation. It's not like the, un the shepherds received an email the night before that said, meet up in field one for an epic event, as we would hope for for today. And yet, they were, they were caught by surprise. These humble means, men and women of means, their reputation was not a good reputation in ways that proved that God's wisdom in trusting the announcement of the birth of Jesus was appropriate for the shepherds. And the reason is threefold. First, they believed. These men and women saw angels. They heard the witness, and they believed. The scribes were too jaded. The royals were too sophisticated. The Romans were too dismissive. But these humble outsiders had the simple faith to look up, to listen, to put their faith in the Christ child. Also, the shepherds were somebody, a group, a class of people who could be awed, could be astonished by what is happening. The world in the first century was pretty cynical. There were false messiahs that had come and gone. The promise of Israel's restoration seemed more like a pipe dream anymore. And the Roman flag waved high above the temple mound, showing that they were an occupied nation. And yet here were people still being willing to be awed, to be flabbergasted. Luke says they were terrified in verse 9. And wouldn't you? You're a lowly shepherd in a backwater town in an occupied land, and suddenly the heavens open. The angels start singing. Yes, I think all of us would be somewhat fearful under those conditions. And yet there is something extraordinary about the ability to still be awed to still be amazed by what God was doing. We see today's world is still cynical and jaded as it was in the first century. Smart people of today are just too enlightened to believe in the supernatural. And yet Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 tells us, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Authentic spirituality is a healthy amazement, a healthy awe, a reverence, and a fear for God. And the closer you are to heaven, the closer you become to being Christ-like, the greater your amazement and fear and awe is of God. And not a fear in the sense of being scared, but in the sense of being amazed, speechless before a holy God. And I pray that our hearts are open to the awe and the wonder of this Christmas season. During this month, let us stop and take time long enough to see what God is doing around us. Let us set aside and unplug the digital distractions long enough to keep our minds focused on that supernatural of that night when Christ's birth. Are we willing to be awed, amazed by the awesome and powerful God, by the mystery of the incarnation, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ? Fearful, amazed, yes. But there's a sense of, that turns that fear into faith. The angel said, don't be afraid. And why would they say that? Because Jesus is a shepherd himself. We no longer need to be afraid. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The royal announcement on that cold night in Bethlehem meant that those who believed in this baby Jesus would experience peace with God. This is what the angels meant when they said, peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. In one sense, the angels were reminding the shepherds that this temporary peace currently being experienced in Rome, in the empire, 
would one day give way to war again, as we've seen throughout the centuries. But only the Prince of Peace could use and show genuine shalom. Shalom means a peace that's so complete that nothing else bothers you. A true renewal of our lives. And the baby Jesus would offer personal peace with God. The one who came to shepherds would be the good shepherd of their souls and our souls. The Lamb of God would fully atone for all sin. No more would the worshipers have to sacrifice lambs at the altar. The final sacrifice had arrived, who took away the sins of the world. And third, the shepherds lived with a purpose. You see, Luke ensures that we know that the shepherds didn't waste time in gazing up into that Bethlehem sky after the announcement. Once they heard the witness of the angels, Luke tells us they hurried to the village and went you. They couldn't keep the message to themselves. They were so bubbled up with excitement and joy. They abandoned all pretenses and bolted to Bethlehem with their sheep in tow with them. They said, the sheep are coming with us. We're going to Bethlehem. We're going to find that Messiah that the angels announced to us. After the shepherds had visited the Messiah, imagine the sight, what it must have been. They went door to door, knocking on the door, saying, the Messiah is here. We've seen him. We've experienced the message from the angels, waking up the locals in that sleepy night, shouting the good news that the long-awaited Messiah had finally come. They didn't marvel at the message. They did more than marvel at the message. They believed. It changed the direction of their hearts and their lives. The angel told the shepherds that the good news was for all people. It was personal to them. It was personal to each one of us. And they left their fields and became the most unlikely messengers. These roughly hewn, these untrained, these likely illiterate shepherds. Think about it. They became the first missionaries. The first in a long line of ordinary, unheralded gospel messengers. God is on the move even today, building the church worldwide. It is estimated that there's over 2 billion Christ followers in the world today. From that handful of shepherds, 2 billion. Primarily through the power of people that you've never heard of. Folks with no official titles, to whom the world thinks is not worthy. So this Christmas, and throughout all year, as our final hymn will be today, each one of us, let's go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And I've included on the other side of your bulletin insert today an Advent study for reflections that you can take home with you this week. And as you study this during the week, consider the significance of the shepherds in the Bible. Read together or by yourself as a family Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and then ask yourself the questions I've listed there as a study of this first of Advent, these reflections that we have today. And then next week, we'll continue our Advent messages with the candle of peace as we discover seeking and finding the wise men. So please read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 in preparation for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the shepherds. We thank you that you are our good shepherd, that Jesus Christ came into this world to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made right with you. We thank you that the shepherds were not afraid to go and proclaim your name. May we proclaim your name through our lives, through our actions, through our words, that others might know Christ. Because like the shepherds, we're telling the good news, that we might go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, 
Listen intentionally. Learn continuously. Lend to others generously. Lead with integrity. And leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward. Enjoy your journey and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.